Well, you can join me in opening your Bibles now to the book of Romans and chapter 8. And if you don't have a Bible with you, I invite you to grab one around you. There's a bunch just scattered around underneath the seats in front of you. And you can find the text we'll look at for this next bit of time on page 944 in those Bibles. Well, there are two kinds of Easter sermons, and both are important. One kind focuses on the historical event of Jesus' resurrection. So the New Testament records eyewitness testimony of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and unfolds those. The other kind of Easter sermon builds on this and assumes the reality of Christ's resurrection and focuses on the radical significance of it and its meaning for our lives and how it changes our lives. So this morning, we'll be looking at the second kind. We'll do, have a second kind of Easter sermon. So we're going to see how Jesus' resurrection gives us real and life-changing hope. And that's what we all want and need, because life is hard. Many of you have experienced incredible, devastating disappointment in life. Some of you this past week or two. Some of you have that coming and don't even know what that might be or when it will come. We sigh through our sufferings, sometimes wondering if we can keep going. And in light of this, some people have a vague sense that there's hope beyond death, right? This life's going to be gone before we know it, and there's a vague sense that there's something else. Others have a kind of wishful thinking. Some people have nice platitudes, but they know deep down that they're just making things up. But real Christianity is different because we have a worldview of hope. And the hope comes from the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, which is the whole point of Easter. The first Easter was the bursting forth of real hope into the world. So when Jesus died, many of his disciples thought that he was a failure, that the whole movement was over. They were depressed and they were hopeless. They had put their hope in him, and he had talked about the resurrection, but they didn't get it. And so when he was dead, they thought it was over. Their hopes were buried with him. But then on the third day, hope rose again. Hope burst forth into the world with the risen Jesus. And it launched a movement of joy in the Roman world. And then far beyond, it's been spreading from culture to culture, from house to house, from person to person ever since then. So the resurrection of Jesus means that darkness will give way to light. There will be a glory yet to come for you and I in the future, all those who trust in Jesus, there will be a glory that even outweighs the present sufferings. That, that all of our sufferings added up together, don't even, the weight doesn't even compare with the heaviness and weight of that great glory to come. And if we set our hope on that, then we'll suffer differently in this life. If your Christianity doesn't make you endure suffering differently than anyone else, then you have the wrong kind of Christianity or it is not penetrated into your heart as deeply as it needs to. You haven't let the message of Easter transform your present life and the future. So, the text we'll look at, Romans 8, verses 23 to 25, show us how this can happen, how, the, how Jesus' resurrection gives a hope for the future that changes how we endure and handle the sufferings and losses of life today. So let's read these verses together. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies for in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this word, and we pray that your spirit now would give us the hope that you speak of here. Kindle this in our minds and our hearts and our lives that we can live with great hope and joy, even in the midst of sorrows. In Jesus' name, amen. So this text is about hope. 
It was mentioned several times toward the end of what we read. Uh, And it's not that complicated to understand when this says that the hope that is seen is not hope. This isn't just hope in an unseen reality, but it's a future reality that we've not yet experienced. That's what it means to hope in something that's not seen. So we're, we're hoping in something that's not seen but will be seen one day. We're longing for something. And so we're setting our hope in that. And this text shows us the promise of hope. And it shows us also not just the promise of what that hope is, but the reason why we can have confidence in that future hope that's not yet seen but will be seen one day. And then it shows us how we can experience this, what it looks like to experience hope. So that's what we'll consider. The promise of hope, the confidence of hope, and the experience of hope. So first, the promise of hope. Now, we're jumping into the middle of a chapter here, in the middle of the book of Romans. So, here's what's going on in Romans chapter 8, this larger chapter. The Apostle Paul wrote this, and he's explaining a massive shift that has happened in the lives of those who have come to know Jesus as their Savior. It's the massive change that trusting Jesus makes in your life. So, we all start out with a sinful nature that's, one way to put it is that we're addicted to ourselves. This is the common human experience. We're turned inward on ourselves and not outward toward loving others and God, and this leads to eternal death. But when we trust in Jesus, condemnation for our sin is replaced with being forgiven. Instead of addiction to ourself and selfishness, we have a new freedom to love. The power of selfishness and sin is broken in our lives. Instead of a future of eternal death, we have a future of eternal life. Instead of being slaves to sin, we're adopted as sons and daughters, children of God, now and forever. So, halfway through the chapter, after explaining all these amazing realities, we're hit with this reality. None of this wondrous truth, being adopted into God's family, completely forgiven, having a future that's incredibly bright, none of those truths means that suffering is removed from our lives right now. The Christian life follows the pattern of Jesus' life, suffering, then glory, Good Friday, then Easter. Paul says this is what you can expect if you're a Christian, suffering now and glory later. But how do we go through this suffering? Verse 18 is the key. This is just a little bit back from where we read this morning. Verse 18, the Apostle Paul says, after introducing this suffering reality, he says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time, meaning just this whole present age until the return of Jesus, all these sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So, there's a glory to come that is so great that it will outweigh our suffering. So, what is the future hope? that outweighs present hardship. Well, there's two aspects to this hope. One is cosmic and one is personal. The cosmic hope is what he explains immediately after making that statement in verses 19 to 22. We took a sermon to look at this a few weeks ago. Paul is telling the story of creation through human history. So, creation had a very good beginning. God made all things and he made them very good. And when sin entered the world through our first ancestors, Adam and Eve, God cursed the ground, and now creation itself is out of order. That's why there's death and decay and natural disasters. But God promised that one day He'd renew all of it, and creation would be liberated. This is verses 19 to 22. You can read it with me. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility. It's when sin entered the world, not willingly, but because of Him, God, who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. So, it's like creation itself is groaning like the pains of childbirth waiting for the birth to come and the glory to come when it's liberated and set free and renewed. So, creation was made good, subjected to corruption, and is waiting in hope for renewal. And one day, the earth will burst forth with joyful, harmonious, flourishing forever. These past few weeks, we've 
all been seeing signs of spring? Because we've been seeing that for like a month and a half. Indiana gives us this tease. It's like everything's great, everything's warm, and then snow. And then everything's great again. Glad we got through that. And then freezing. Um, But the flowers are starting to come up. The grass is getting greener. The weather is warmer. Our weeping cherry tree is about to blossom. Just be beautiful with white. Spring is beautiful and it's arriving. But it always takes a while. Winter keeps hanging on. Martin Luther said that if someone had never experienced spring, but they had only known kind of the cold, gray, arid winter, and you described what spring was like, they would never believe you. The beauty that just covers the earth and fills the world with color. If they only know the winter gray, they would not believe just how beautiful spring will get. And that's how it is for us now. We have glimpses of the spring of the new creation that's going to come. I mean, some of the places of this earth, you've either been there or you've seen pictures, are just beautiful. The sunsets, the sunrises, the fields covered with purple and colors. And the ocean is even beautiful at times. And that's just a glimpse of what the whole creation is waiting for to burst into beauty. Even some of the broken desert arid places are beautiful even in in their brokenness and desertedness. And they're going to flourish one day. This is our promised future and creation is longing for this. I was a Christian for a number of years before I realized that this is the, the cosmic hope of real Christianity. Many people think that Christianity teaches that the material world is bad, maybe neutral at best, but God made this world. It displays His glory and goodness. In all of its beauty and goodness, it's a reflection of Him. He made it good, and one day He'll renew it all. So real Christianity is not against the physical world. It's not against beauty. Jesus is not against creativity and hobbies and vocation, and sexuality, and soccer, and so forth. Jesus embraces the goodness of the world as a gift. But creation also is shot through with brokenness, and decay, and corruption, and death. And so, we're looking forward to the day when God makes everything new. He's not going to crumple it up and throw it in a trash can. He's going to make all things new. So this is the cosmic hope. But there's also a personal hope. This is verse 23 now. This is what we read at the beginning here. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So Paul's talking about Christians here, those who have come to know Jesus as their Savior. And he's saying that we now groan inwardly because of our suffering. So sometimes our emotions are like an ocean with just these waves of sighs and sorrows and grief and lament are part of our lives. And we're inwardly groaning. And this is a normal part of our experience now. Sin and suffering touch every part of our lives, touches us morally and physically and emotionally, and mentally, spiritually. But this groaning is temporary. It's a groaning in hope, in the hope of resurrection. So just as creation is longing for the renewal and the full spring to come, the eternal spring, we too, in in the midst of all of our suffering, are groaning and longing for our physical bodies to be renewed, raised from the dead and renewed with creation forever. So Paul refers to the resurrection here, but it's interesting. He refers to it with the word redemption. He refers to the redemption of our bodies. Did you see that? Redemption is usually used to refer to our experience of our initial salvation. We're redeemed. It's the forgiveness of our sins. But Paul says that redemption also applies to the completion of our experience. It applies to our bodies. So God is not going to throw our bodies away. He's going to redeem them and renew them. 
So our redemption is not yet complete until our bodies get in on it. You experience the forgiveness of sins when you come to Christ, the renewal of your heart, and your bodies will also be renewed. The completion of redemption is not just going to heaven when we die and letting our bodies decay forever. Even in heaven, which is far better than now because we're with the Lord Jesus as we prayed together a few minutes ago. But even in heaven, there's more to come. Our redemption is not yet complete. We're longing for the redemption of our bodies and the renewal of creation where we'll live with our triune God forever. So the Bible doesn't affirm a Gnostic idea that the body's bad. Your body's not a prison to escape. It's a wonder that God created. It's broken and it's failing because of our current age. We have all sorts of desires that are mixed up and disordered, and our body fails, but one day it'll be made new. C.S. Lewis wrote an essay called The Weight of Glory, and he wrote about how this reality should change how we think of not just ourselves, but even one another. Everyone will either be raised to newness of life, or they'll be raised to depart to eternal suffering. Here's how he put it. He said, it's a serious thing to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature with which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilization, these are mortal, and their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals with whom we joke, who we work with, marry, snub, and exploit, immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. And so this just reminds us and just sets us that in, in the story We are groaning for this everlasting renewal and wonder and splendor to come. This is the promise of hope, both cosmic and personal. But how do we know this is real and applies to us? How is it that this isn't just wishful thinking? Where where can we have confidence in this hope? And the answer is our second point, the confidence of hope. This is confidence is tied to the word first fruits. It's mentioned here in verse 23. It refers to Christians as those who have the first fruits of the Spirit. So, first fruits is an agricultural metaphor. It refers to the beginning of the harvest. When the harvest of wheat is ready, the first part gathered in is called the first fruits. And this means two things. It means that you have the beginning of the harvest already, and you have confidence in the completion of the harvest yet to come. Or you can think of it like a down payment on a home. Whatever you put down in the home is the beginning of the full payment, and it gives confidence that you're good for the rest, and it's coming. Or you can think of it like an appetizer or first course of a meal. It's the beginning of the meal, and it gives you confidence that the rest is coming. So here's how this relates to our confidence and hope. The Bible refers to this future renewal of all things, this new creation and resurrection life, Um, in in what we could call the age of the Holy Spirit, the age of the Spirit. The prophet Isaiah said that this new creation would come, and it would describe it as God's Spirit being poured out on the land, bringing renewal. The Spirit is the giver of life. Or resurrection as the Spirit, God's breath and Spirit entering in to corpses to raise them to new life. But the surprise here is that that coming, renewal, spring, new creation, resurrection life has already begun. Verse 23 says that we have, as Christians, this Holy Spirit as the first fruits of this great renewal to come. So, Jesus rose from the dead on that first Easter, and then 50 days later, He poured out His Spirit on the church. We call that the day of Pentecost. It was the beginning of the harvest season. It was a feast of Israel when the first fruits of the crop were gathered. And God chose that day to be the day that He pours out His Spirit as first fruits 
on his people. Paul is saying that Christians have now already received the spirit of life and the spirit is given as first fruits because he's giving us the beginning of this resurrection life already. We are raised to spiritual life already and we're waiting for its completion and the completion is coming and we have confidence in that because he's already started this renewal. So you are raised spiritually now when you trust in Jesus as the appetizer of the meal to come, as the down payment of the full amount, as the first fruits of the harvest to come. It's the first taste of the renewal, the first experience of the eternal spring to come. So do you have the Holy Spirit? If you are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, the risen Lord, then you do. It is a gift for all who come to Christ. And this gift gives you confidence that as you experience this renewal, I mean, the very fact that you trust in Jesus is a sign that the Spirit has given you life. That itself, that you're trusting and hoping in Him, is a sign that life is in you. And that means you have the beginning of all the rest that's to come, and you have confidence that the rest will come. But there's another way this word first fruits gives us confidence and hope. And this is the direct connection to Easter and Jesus' resurrection. Did you know Jesus' resurrection itself is called a first fruits? The first fruits of the resurrection from the dead? In 1 Corinthians 15, here's how Paul put it He said, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, of those who have died. So it's as though though all God's people are like buried as seeds in the ground. I mean, cemeteries are gardens. And dead bodies are seeds planted. And they're buried there. And one day a great resurrection will come. And all these seeds will sprout. And bodies will be raised from the dead. And Paul is saying that Jesus' resurrection, he was planted like a seed when he was buried like the rest of the dead. And the first one now has come up. The first sign of spring has happened. The first inbreaking of the new creation has dawned. The first fruits of the resurrection harvest has come. Jesus is the first fruits of the whole harvest, which includes all those who trust him. Paul goes on to say, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. So here's how this connects to everything we saw before. The creation and our own bodies are subjected to this curse that came because of sin. The creation and we ourselves are groaning in pain, longing for renewal. But this curse came because of sin and death is a just punishment for sin. Jesus came in order to absorb that punishment in himself, to take the consequence of sin upon himself, to take our death upon himself. And when he rose, he was showing that the curse of death is broken. He absorbed it completely for us. Now there's life that can burst forth. Sins are forgiven. Death's power is broken. Death itself is defeated. The resurrection life, the undoing of the curse, has now broken into history with the resurrection of Jesus at Easter. So this is why we can have confidence in this hope. Jesus' resurrection was a moment in space and time history, physical event, and God is showing that resurrection is not just possible, it's begun. The future resurrection that you will be part of has already begun. The first fruits is, are gathered in at Easter, and so this means the rest of the harvest will come. Jesus' resurrection, when, when we picture Jesus' resurrection body, when the disciples saw it, what they were seeing is a glimpse of their own future. Our bodies will be conformed to His one day. So these are the reasons why we can have confidence in hope. One of these is objective and the other subjective. So the objective reason is that Jesus' resurrection was a real historical event. It's the beginning of the coming day of resurrection for God's people. And the subjective reason, which is also an objective reality, is the gift of the Spirit to Christians. We experience resurrection life already now, 
And that is a sign that there's more to come. Our redemption will be completed. So, I've seen the promise of hope and the confidence in hope. So, finally, the experience of hope. So, how do we actually experience this? This hope in everyday life. What difference does it make? How do we get it? So, I want to make just three observations about this experience of hope from this text. First is this. This takes deliberate consideration. We can cultivate hope. You can cultivate real hope in your life by a deliberate act of consideration. This is verse 18. If we go back a few verses again, this is what Paul said as he introduced this hope that we've been considering. He said, I consider, do you see that? I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that's to be revealed to us. So the hinge between the hopelessness in your life and real hope, the hinge of that is an act of considering, of considering with your heart and your mind a certain reality here, setting your mind on these future realities. And when you do this, it changes your perspective on your current life, and it gives you hope to carry on. This is part of what happens when you become a Christian. If you want to become a Christian, this is how you do it. You trust in Jesus as your only hope. You affirm that He died for your sins, that He took the death and the the end of your life that should have been your end, and that He rose again, and He's coming back to renew all things and raise His people. Consider that and trust Him for it. You don't do anything for this. You just receive this. You, you put your trust in Him. You turn away from your sins. You, you turn away from trying to prove yourself to Him, and you receive this. And you'll receive the Holy Spirit. And this renewal that happens in you is the first sign of all that's to come. And for those who are already Christians, we have to reconsider this every day and throughout the day, don't we? If Every day we wake up and we we have these concerns that flood our minds. I mean, we go to bed and they come on our minds. We wake up and they flood our minds throughout a day. We have these concerns and problems. Fresh suffering comes at, at us. A friend of ours or a family member has a burden and we bear that with them. And we have to deliberately consider our hope. We have to get it back in view. So here's what it looks like in practice. Some of you were here a couple weeks ago when my brother Trent preached, and he said that anxiety comes, which is pervasive among us, right? Anxiety comes when we keep imagining our worst possible future, right? That stuck with me. We imagine our worst possible future on any given scenario, at work or with children or with a friend or with school or with a test, we imagine how bad it could possibly be, and then it frustrates us, it worries us, we get anxious about it, we get depressed about it, we lose hope, or we start trying to just control life to ensure that that worst possible scenario doesn't happen. But here's how hope changes us. What if instead of imagining our worst possible future, we started hoping in our best actual future? Because that's what the resurrection promises. What if you turn those moments of anxiety, and as you experience the emotion of anxiety, what if you let that be a reminder to set your hope in Jesus? What if your anxiousness can become a doorway to prayer? What if you let your moments of worry cause you to consider not your worst case scenario, your worst possible future, but your best actual future that's coming? So we need to deliberately consider this. And that's the hinge between hopelessness and hope. Second, combine groaning with eagerness. Look at verse 23 again. He says, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly. Inward groaning, eager waiting. Not one or the other. Both of them together. That is, seems to be rare in my experience maybe yours as well, to hold both of those experiences together. But it's a powerful combination. Some people are really good at groaning inwardly and outwardly. (laughs) Maybe that's you. 
Maybe you see the pain, you see the suffering, you're burdened by the weight of trials, you're often sad, you're often darkened with depression, and your mood sinks into a funk often. You groan for things to get better, but you rarely experience this thrill of hope and an eager expectation at Christ's return and the new creation coming. You rarely let your horizon lift above your immediate circumstances to see the horizon of His return. And therefore, that hope doesn't permeate your perspective. Others of you are maybe good at eagerly waiting. You do often think about God's goodness, about His promises. You look forward to being with Christ forever. But maybe some people around you have experienced you to be flippant about trials in life. You don't grieve over the brokenness of sin in the world. You're not burdened by other people's problems. In fact, you quickly dismiss other people's pain, and you're somewhat impatient with them. Why can't they they just get the hope together? Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We grieve, but not without hope. Jump to the hope too quickly. So, real Christianity combines both of those together. We groan inwardly as we wait eagerly. And this is a powerful combination. This is what has made Christians historically suffer differently and in a surprising way. Entering into people's troubles and even carrying burdens themselves with an inward groaning that is felt and empathetic. And yet there is at the same time an eager waiting and hopefulness. So figure out which way you lean toward the groaning or the waiting and eagerness and learn to cultivate the other. If you're good at groaning, start hoping in Christ's return. If you're joyful about Christ's return, don't treat the suffering yours or others as cheap and insignificant. The combination of groaning and eagerness is what makes Christians suffer differently and can even surprise other people who wonder, what is with your hope that takes suffering seriously and it isn't overwhelmed by it? Finally, look to the triune God as the center of this hope. The new creation and new bodies are an incredible gift and they matter. God wants us to care and eagerly wait for those things, but the best part is God himself. In fact, everything in the wondrous creation that we love and that we will love in the future is an expression of the radiance of His own glory and is meant to point to Him that it would kindle worship in our hearts to Him, not to praise creation, but to praise Him. We were made by God and for God. So in the beginning, we walked with God in true community and friendship. And then we left Him and Jesus came as the friend of sinners to bring us back. And he rose from the dead, and he poured out his Spirit, and the Holy Spirit himself, this first fruits that we experience now, is not just kind of an abstract promise. It is the presence of God himself. The heart of all that's coming is God himself for us, and he's given himself to us already as the first fruits. So, this is the first fruits of the new creation, it's the, and it's the Holy Spirit because the best of what's to come is God Himself. The, the Holy Spirit is our first taste of enjoying God forever. So, here's our hope. The promise of hope, cosmic and very personal for each one of us. Our confidence and hope from Jesus' resurrection as the first fruits of what's to come and the outpoured Holy Spirit given to every Christian as the beginning of the future experience, and then our experience of hope cultivated by deliberately considering the hope and the promise He's given us and eagerly waiting as we groan for the renewal of all things. So, if this is your hope, then keep considering it moment by moment. Turn your thoughts of your worst possible future into thoughts of your best actual future. And if this is not yet your hope, it can be. Turn from your sin, trust in Jesus, receive His life and His promise forever. Let's pray.
Our Father, we thank you so much that we have great news to celebrate this morning on Easter and every moment of every day. We thank you for the dawn of the new creation that's already shining in the world because of Jesus' resurrection and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We thank you that this dawn has risen in our hearts already. For all who trust in Jesus, we pray that for those who have not yet seen the light of this beauty and experience the presence of the Spirit and trust in Jesus, we pray that that would happen right now and today. We pray that you would continue to cultivate this hope in us, that we would be people that groan, but with eagerness, especially to see you face to face in Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, this 